This is a beautiful place. Thank you so much for inviting us to your home. No, nah, you're very welcome, man. You know, this is uh, the American dream. As they said, the American dream's dead. That was a lie. It's still alive and thriving. You just got to work for it. And, you know, after 25 years, I've been very fortunate. I'm going to say fortunate. I've worked really, really hard. You know? really, this is pretty good for a guy who punches people in the face for a living. Yeah. Well, you know, we had to have uh, good business savvy. I think that's very yeah. important. You know, you got to think about the, the ending game. Um, I thought about the ending game when I was in my 20s, when I was world champ. You know, I, I wanted to understand what was the next step after fighting. What am I going to get into? You know, is it promotion? You know, is it commentating? Is it owning businesses? And uh, I think I'm just kind of tapping into each one. You know, a lot of people, they have a plan B. I don't have a plan B. My head's plan A every single time. You know, yeah. I just keep pushing, keep working and chase this American dream. It's important. You mentioned 25 years. May 30th was the 25 year anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Did you do anything special that day? Um, not too special. You know, um, a few of my buddies, you know, Special Force guys, uh, we got to party, um, have a bunch of shots. And I really don't remember the end of the night, but uh, we had fun. <laughs> Sounds like a good night then. Yeah, we had, we had fun. Uh, we got home safe. Uh, of course, I had a designated driver, but uh, it's just one of those things that I look back on it and I'm just thankful I have the fans I have. You know, I love each and every one of them, you know, even the ones that do hate me. Uh, I'm fortunate because you got the haters and you got the lovers. And uh, the scariest thing is have ones that don't talk about you at all. And, you know, I've understood that, understood that from day one for you know, my career, at least in fighting. When you talk about like, you know, having a plan moving forward for what you're going to do after fighting, when did that really begin for you? Um, God, I think about it. And I, I would say watching other boxers that were, you know, multimillionaires and all of a sudden they had nothing. Yeah. What am I going to do to make sure I make the right decisions for the future? Uh, I'm not just for me, for my kids. And when I had my, my first son, Jacob, who's 20 now, is at ASU University, um, on the wrestling team on a full ride. I, uh, that's what kind of scared me of knowing that it's not just about me anymore. It's about my family. You know, I have twin boys now, uh, Jesse and Journey, who are 13. They've been homeschooled the last two days. But I want to be there as a present father. I mean, I didn't have my father. My father chose drugs over me and it was it was sad, but I was not going to be a victim. And I planned to be a victor, so I worked my butt off to make it happen. That audio is going to be horrible. Yeah, that's, it's okay. The, the, yeah. the helicopter, whatever this is. Yeah, no, it should be a helicopter. It is a helicopter, yep. yeah. Yep. I feel like you got into UFC at like the exact perfect time. Like life is all about timing. If you were five years earlier, we wouldn't be sitting here right now, I don't think. Yeah, we would. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I had big dreams at a really, really young age. Um, and this is kind of weird. So when I was probably about seven, eight, nine in those, in those years, I'd have dreams of being on red carpets, of people taking pictures of me and saying, Tito, this way, this way, this way. And back then they didn't have red carpets. And so I, I maybe this was kind of either God or just you know my personal stuff preparing me for what's gonna happen in the future. And as I got older, things just, really didn't come easy. They came as the harder I worked, the easier they were, but I worked really, really hard. They're very diligent. I just, you know, just time consuming the things I put into is just eat, sleep, train, repeat. That's exactly what I did during my fight years. But you know, before that, I knew there was something I was gonna do. I was gonna be a professional wrestler, a professional boxer. And all of a sudden by accident, this mixed martial arts came about. And um, I fought in UFC 13, like I said, May 30th, 1997. Yeah. I it's fought for amateur. free yeah. as an amateur. Uh, no UFC fighter in history, and you can look that up. No UFC history, or fighter in history has ever fought for free. And I did it just to kind of test myself to see how good I truly could be. You know, uh, being a uh, JC Junior College uh, State Champion in wrestling, 190 pounds. They made it uh, weight class back then was middleweight, was 199. Um, I thought I'd give it a try. You know, I was training with Tank Abbott, who fought in the UFC at the time, and I was like, you know, let's give this a try. I called him up. Hey, Tank, uh, you didn't give me a fight. And he's like, ugh. You want to fight? Like, yeah, no, I want to just see how good I am. Um, so I fought May 30th, 1997. Uh, I stopped my first guy in 22 seconds. Um, I visualized myself in the finals and the guy who made it to the finals, uh, instant in a way, he ended up getting hurt. And I was the replacement. Um, I was beating Guy Metzger and then they separated us, put it back on our feet and I had it in a dominant position. I would, I'd cut him with a big cut or hit him with a big shot, cut him. and. They restarted our feet. I went to go for a takedown. I got caught in a guillotine. And I didn't know what that was at that time. I didn't do much jujitsu, you know, maybe white belt stuff. And I had a tap, but I was hooked. I, I, I loved it. You know, as a kid growing up on the streets, uh, parents not being around me that much, um, I was always dying for attention. And the attention was there of fans going, hey, let me have an autograph. And I didn't realize uh, what I was getting myself into. But to come to realize that this is going to be the making of Tito Ortiz. 
What was the conversation like before you went to UFC? Like, so you asked Tank, Tank Abbott, can I go there and have a fight? What's the conversation look like after that when UFC is actually signing you to do this? Um, I was really nervous, really nervous. Um, There's a little fear in my heart because uh, my high school wrestling coach, Paul Herrera, who fought uh, Gary Goodrich, fought him, I think uh, three UFCs prior to that, got caught in a crucifix and got elbowed and got knocked out and they had to do uh, a skull reconstruction on his cheek. And that put fear in my heart, realizing that you can get seriously injured doing the sport. Yeah. But that was what lit the fire under my ass. I kind of was like, you know what? I better train hard. Yeah. I better train hard as I possibly can. You know, I was training three times a day, six days a week, and I was doing as much as I possibly could to prepare for the fight. So when it did come about uh, May 30th, I, I had that mentality in my mind is like, uh, gotta be a shark and don't stop moving. And in the cage and people watch me pace back and forth. And that's my mentality is be a shark, you know, um, eat before you be eaten. When you talk about visualization, what specifically does it look like for you? Um, visualization is really huge for me because I understood this as, as a wrestler, you know, our coach would sit us in a wrestling room, turn off all the lights and say, all right, you guys are warming up. And we would just do this mentally. We'd go warm up, close your eyes. We warm it up. All right, doing our shots, doing these takedowns. All right, first period starts, boom, go, what happens? In my mind, I'm going for the takedown or he shoots a shot and I'm trying to de defend it. And I'm going through the situation in my mind without even doing any physical stuff at all. It's all, you know, psychological things that I put myself through of how I know of getting taken down or coming back in reversal, getting back on our feet. I get the takedown. 10 seconds left, I got to push, push, look for the takedown. I get a takedown, my arm being raised. Well, I contributed that right into mixed martial arts. When I got into it was I would sit there the night before the fight. I would sit in my room, I'd shut the lights off and I'd hear the first guy be announced to walk out. Then I'd visualize myself walking out and the fans screaming and, you know, Bruce Buffer saying my name and looking across at the guy and John McCarthy stepped in the middle saying, are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on and go through the whole fight. Um, I get hit with a shot and how am I going to react? Yeah. I hit him with a shot. How am I going to react? And these are the type of things that I've done through my whole career. I mean, even life in general, of every day of just walking around other people, if someone came up to me and tried to start a fight, how am I going to react to it? You know, um, and these are things that are just life lessons that I've learned and I'm able to hand these down to my children also. Yeah. It can't just be fighting though. I'm sure you visualize in other aspects like when your sons were born or things like that. Yeah, when my sons are born or, you know, um, how about challenging days of getting through training and how am I gonna get through it? You know, and just take one day at a time and just uh, take it, you know, day by day, week by week, month by month. Uh, and with my kids, you know, my kids ask me one question, how am I gonna respond that way? If I respond one way, would it be better if I respond this way? And that's one of the things I've learned is, you know, always respond to somebody in a positive manner. Yeah. Because if you get them with a positive manner, it usually throws people off. Yeah. Because most of the time people want to have, not have, but they, they get a negative response or something like that. Then yeah. their automatic defense mode comes up. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned through my life is a lot of fans who come up to me and they're very hands-on, you know, like, oh my God, Tito Ortiz and grab onto me. And it's like, hey bro, I got my personal space, chill. And the guy's like, oh, you're a dick anyways. I was like, okay, cool. That's your, that's your belief. Well, you guys are saying, oh, you look big and bad. And you're not like that tough. I go, you, do, yeah, you, you do look big and bad. You, you're correct. I'm not. And, and, and I play with it. But I, I really just uh, kill them with kindness. Yeah. And I think it's important. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an aggressive person. You know, I, I wasn't a person that really loved to fight. What I loved to was compete. Mm -hmm. I love to compete. I'm, like I said, I'm not a vicious guy. I don't like to beat people up. It's not something that I enjoy doing, but something that I got paid really well doing. What was the first thing you competed at? What was your first sport? Uh, first sport comp in competition was uh, wrestling. wrestling. You know, yeah, my freshman year. Um, I walked into the wrestling room in Huntington High and I uh, asked, where's the ring at? <laughs> the coach <laughs> laughed at me. He's Big like, WWF fan. Oh, huge. Hulk Hogan, you know, say your prayers, take your vitamins, brother. Um, you know, Tito Santana, Macho Man Randy Savage, the Ultimate Warrior. Back in the day, that, that was stuff that I thought it was real. I mean, I, until I got into wrestling, I realized that there was the difference. Um, but then, you know, fast forward it 26 years later, I ended up going to uh, the WWF uh, training facility and worked with them for two weeks. And um, I got to see how hard it truly was. It's real. People say it's not real. You know what? The outcomes is not real. Sure. It's, it's predetermined. Yeah. But the stuff they go through is they are true athletes. I have respect for each and every one of them for what they've done. Um, but I, I've kind of found that happy meeting with mixed martial arts with myself, you know, between yeah. boxing and Muhammad Ali and Hulk Hogan and WWF. And I got to have that same aspect with mixed martial arts. And, you know, I was, uh, people call it cockiness. I call it confidence, uh, bleach blonde hair, you know, flames on my shorts. I had that little niche, uh, 
that people were attracted to. I feel like that's one of the reasons that you were so popular in UFC because not only were you an athlete, not only were you finishing fights, but you were a personality. Yeah. And they were like starving for that at that time. At that time, they didn't really have that. They had a little bit out with Tank, but Tank wasn't a guy that really trained super hard. You know, um, he always looked for, you know, escape routes. Uh, with me, I had the, the championship mentality came from wrestling, you know, of hard work, dedication, um, sacrifice, you know, discipline, the things that life's about. This is how life is. And if it's like uh, either you're going to be a victim or you're going to be a victor. And I just I prevailed. You know, I worked super, super hard. And now my kids see how, how I work. And I, I'm fortunate that I fought for as long as I have because my kids have watched me evolve, not just as a, a fighter, but, you know, as a businessman, as a father um, and as a man in general, because I'm handing these down to my kids, just the, the sacrifice and um, discipline that I've had through my career. I want to say when we walked in here, both of your kids got up off the couch, walked right over. Nice to meet you. I'm Journey. Like, like you're raising gentlemen. That's my goal. I'm not raising kids. I'm not raising boys. We have our kid time. You know, we just went to Magic Mountain last week for Father's Day. Uh, I'm raising men. And it's important because a mirror of myself is my children. And I want people to respect me and I want my kids to have respect that I have. Yeah. And it's important because I, uh, I was just, day before yesterday, I was at lunch and um, I met one of their friends, uh, father and mother, and they walked up and like, your kids are real gentlemen. I'm like, thank you. And that's the, I mean, I, I gotta say, that's the biggest thing in the world just to have parents reach out to me and saying that I'm doing a great job as a father because I never had a handbook. I, 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 look, I understand a little bit when I was in college, you know, child development, but I never understood how to be a father because I never had one. I, I never understood, yeah. you know, what was the right way to do it every single day. I understood of, from right and wrong and then I come to realize that, you know, I had to use common sense at the end of the day to raise my, my children right and I want them to be respected. Who was the father figure for you? For you? Um, father figure for me, wow. I, I had a couple, you know, I had a teacher, uh, Tom Wynum from Huntington Beach High, who helped me out during high school a lot. Um, prior to that, there was a couple guys that I fished with a lot down in Newport Beach. Um, but it was just little small things that, that I took from each person. You know, I really didn't have a solid one all the time. You know, I had a stepdad in high school time um, who always told me, you know, no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. But it was never a positive, you know, like grab a hold of you and hug you and say, I love you, son. I'm proud of you. I never had that. Yeah. And I don't make sure my kids don't miss that. You yeah. know, all the time I grab and say, I love you. I'm proud of you. No matter what they do, it's, um, Something that I think um, human nature needs, especially yeah. as men, they need that. And there's that time and space where it's either hard love or it's just straight love that you got to give to your child. Yeah. And like I say, as being a parent is very difficult. Um, it's not easy, but it's my choice. I want them on this earth. Sure. Um, they didn't want to be on here. I want them here. So I got to be responsible and make sure I do the right things. Like I say, to build the next generation of the Ortiz. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy because the kids are doing damn well when they're straight A students. My oldest is ASU. Um, it makes me happy. It makes me really do, happy. Do we have a future UFC champion? Uh, no, he's actually, yeah. I would say, a lot smarter than me in business. So he's a business major right now. And he goes, Dad, I'm going to be, I'll be an attorney for uh, the fighters. Or I'll be a manager for the fighters. And then I have my twins, Jesse and Journey. And uh, Journey's like, Dad, I'm going to be a champion like you. And he already takes jujitsu and wrestling right now. But uh, his brother, Jer uh, Jesse, he's like, uh, Dad, I, I, I'm going to be Journey's attorney. Like, <laughs> he actually just started, uh, actually, he starts uh, next week. Um, he starts, uh, was it uh, elementary law school? Um, it starts from 12 to 18. What? Yeah, he wanted to do it. He found, he looks, um, they've been in homeschooled now for the last two years. And he's like, dad, I've seen this online uh, law school classes that I can take. Um, if I get straight A's and I save the money, can I do it? I was like, if you get straight A's, I'll pay for it. No worries. Wow. It's 180 bucks uh, per semester. And it's, but still, it's giving that opportunity just kind of to uh, give them to, understand of what's going on just in the basics you know basic fundamentals of it that's a really interesting point like because when you can give your kids everything how do you pull back on that see now this is one of the things that people i mean and i get what the government are how can i say this politically correct way um over the last 30 years what they have done to this country is soften everybody and a lot of parents have fell for it by doing ipads cell phones video games and that's their get away from me time. And it's kind of harsh to say it that way, but I want to be a parent that's responsible for my kids and their future. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to make sure their education is important and work hard for the things they have. I don't give them everything, but they can have everything. When they get straight A's, they can do what they want, but they got to get straight A's. Um, they got to make sure they have chores. They got to make sure their bed's made. 
that our, clo our clothes can get washed, but get the pile, we put it on their bed. So you gotta fold your laundry, put it away. Any dishes that they cook with, they clean their dishes, they put them away. And this is responsibilities. Like I say, I'm building men. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not gonna do everything for them. You know, my uh, wife, Amber, she's not gonna do everything for them. We'll set them up for it, but they gotta finish it. And now it's got to a point now where, you know, I, I could leave for a day or two and I don't have to worry about it. You know, they know to keep the doors locked. You know, they have, they have a cell phone and they can only use a cell phone to call back and forth to us. Um, but they're able to get their time by working for it. Mm. I want to make sure everything's not given for them because I mean, I financially, I can give them whatever they want. They have, sure. they have, they've never had a cell phone today. They have a cell phone from where we're away. I would give it to them just so we stay in contact. But yeah. I mean, since four years old, they never had a cell phone. They never had an iPad, nothing like that. I want to make sure that they understand as you've seen how they get off the, the chair and introduce themselves. Yeah. I want them to be social, um, socially, acceptable to other people yeah. and to understand and go, wow, these kids are actually very well mannered. It's like, see son, that's your character. Yeah. How do you want to build your character? And then the games they play, they're like, dad, I want the fastest, strongest, smartest guy. I go, well, that's you. That's what you need to do. Yeah. So they understand they could correlate the differences between those two. I would say that a lot of UFC fans will argue that you were certainly not a gentleman when it came to your promos. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot <laughs> of that came character? to marketing. No, it just came to marketing. I understand marketing. You know, either I'm going to have guys who hate me or love me. Yeah. Um, when they stopped talking about me is when I worried. And that never really happened because it was either someone talking smack on me and <laughs> or people love me because they understood uh, how I was. You know, at the end of the day, when it came to being in a cage, it was never about the fans. It was about the fighter who I was fighting against. Um, and fans took it personal of what I would say about that guy. Um, there was three rule um, laws of rule of, you know, trash talk. Don't talk about a family. Don't talk about their religion. And don't talk about their country. Everything beyond that is free game. I look at a lot of trash talk now and they break all those rules. Break all those rules. But once again, it's, it's karma and it always comes back and they end up losing. And I, there's a lot of things. Like I say, man, I, I'm, I'm not a big church going guy. Um, I believe in God. You know, Jesus was a man just like the rest of us who's to try to spread the word that we're trying to spread, you know, for our humanity, to keep humanity um, safe. Uh, but at the end of the day, karma is number one. Mm. You know, the way you treat somebody um, is the way you're going to be treated. If you're an asshole to someone, it's going to come back to you. Yeah. You know, um, if you treat someone like shit, it's going to come back to you. You know, and as a kid, I used to steal because I didn't have the things that other kids had. And my parents weren't there for me. So that's all I understood. And as I got a little older, you know, I graduated high school. I came to realize that the things that I stole, all of a sudden, all the stuff that I had was getting stolen in the same way. Wow. Karma wow. comes full circle in life um, uh. all the time. And, you know, like I said, every day I lay my bed, I you know put my head down. I could be happy with the things I've done. You know, when I look in the mirror and I, I brush my teeth, I got to answer to myself. I don't have a big entourage by me. And all my fans know, they never see me with a big entourage. You know, maybe when I was the world champ and I had, you know, 10 of my close friends, you know, now my circle's a lot smaller, um, but I really have four quarters and a hundred pennies. It's, uh, it's just one of those things I'm very fortunate. You know, at the end of the day, I, I look at it and I got to have integrity for myself. I got to yeah. respect for myself yeah. and I got to respect people the same way. It really seemed like Ken Shamrock took the trash talk personally. Like that seemed like really personal. That was personal for both of us. I think that was the Even only- after the fight was over? Um, after the third fight was over, we, we, we got a little kosher towards each other. Um, then a few years later on, we met each other a couple times and we're cool, we're, we're good. You know, we hashed it out and it was good. You know, I, I think about it and I think that was the only trilogy that I did for UFC that was true. It was honest. The it Chuck was, one wasn't? Nah, that was all fabrication um, of the UFC. Mm. And I, I, when you have two guys who were friends and stayed at the same home together, he stayed at my house, I stayed at his house. I mean, we were team punishment. I mean, there was a t-shirt of both of us, our hands crossed next to each other, saying team punishment on it. Uh, but when it came down to money, he sold himself out. And I, I, I want to say I get it, but I don't get it um, because you know, I try to make sure that any friends that are around me, I treat him like family. And it came to a point where he sold out and instead of making 10 to 20 million, he got an extra million after he beat me the second time. And like I say, I, I'm not crying over spilt milk. It is what it is. It's behind me and my life's forward. And I've, um, I'm fortunate to be where I am right now. And I'm just happy my kids are happy. And uh, they come up to me every day and saying, dad, I love you. I'm proud of you. So. That's a, that makes all the difference in the world. Still talk, talk to Chuck at all? Um, not much. I think the last time I had seen him in Vegas and it was just more, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? And no more than that. Yeah. What about Ken Shamrock? Uh, Shamrock, I haven't talked to him, gosh, in six years, I think, about six years. Who would you, who's your closest friend within fighting? Uh, 
Rampage and Randy Couture. Okay. Yeah, me and Randy Couture are pretty close. So inside joke, he's my dad. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was at an event in uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we do Waiting for Wishes where we go and we serve the public. They buy a table and we're trying to raise money and so forth for it. And we went out the night before, went to a bar drinking and everything. And some, you know, pretty cute chick comes walking up to us. And he's all, is it okay if I take a picture with you and your dad? I'm all, yes, you can. <laughs> hey, dad. And he's like looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Dad, dad, come here, come here. He's like, what? Do you She says she wants to take her picture with me and my dad. <laughs> he's like, oh, you fucker. So that, that was our inside joke. But, you know, another one is Rampage. Rampage is a close friend of mine. Uh, you know, I've known him now since uh, 1998. And wow. uh, we go way back and... He's like a brother to me, man. He's, he's a good dude, hardworking guy, got kids, fi family man also. Uh, we just did an event, of course, uh, Freedom Fight Night, uh, where we coached against each other and we trash talks back and forth. And um, But he's a good dude. He has a good heart and he's, he's a really awesome guy also. I think the one thing I'll never forget from the Ken Shamrock trilogy is Tito Ortiz is a punk. <laughs> right? I was like, it, it played right before Ken Shamrock came out. Yeah, and then I remember warming, not warming up, I was just like kind of shaking it out right before the fight. And I looked at my scene and I was like, Oh, this guy I think it repeated uh, three times. Like Tito Ortiz four times. is a punk. Yeah, like four times, I think. <laughs> but it, it, I, I think it got me on my, my toes. You know, the first time was the first time we fought. And at that point, it was like, I was intimidated by him. I really, I was the champion, but still, I was intim intimidated by him because that was Ken Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man. Yeah. And then after when the first little, you know, exchange happened, I was like, oh, I'm going to smash this guy. Because, you know, he did have all the big bulk on him, but, you know, that's superficial. I grabbed a hold of him and was like squeezing a turn up. It was just like... <laughs> I latched on him. I mean, I got wrestling strength. I mean, I, I'm, I don't use a PED or steroid thing. I've kept away from that because I want to have, you know, a longevity in my career. And I've understood that. I saw a lot of guys do the TRT and, you know, they look like they're 60 years old now. Um, and I think that that really speeds up the aging process in your body. And I've understood that, you know, being a physical education major, I've understood that. And I was like, you know what, I got to keep away from that because I want my body to last a long time. And, you know, I'm 47 and I feel like I'm like, 35. I feel, uh, you look great. You no, know, I feel I, I feel amazing. It's just uh, one of those things that I just got to make sure I keep on the upkeep of my body. You know, eat clean, uh, train at least four times a week. Uh, right now, I just picked it up last week, so I do five times uh, until about two more weeks, and then I'll do six times a week. You think you got another fight in you? I do have another fight in me. I'll be fighting again. I'll be fighting. Uh, hopefully, I'll be fighting for a free to fight night. You know, let's see how it goes after that. You know, Randy Couture fought until he was 48 years old, and I just, I love the competition. I love getting in a cage and competing against another man. Um, I love just seeing the process of my body just going through uh, phases of, you know, going from kind of pudgy, a little fat, to being shredded in physique shape, or just like, holy shit, that guy's in shape. You know, I just fought, was it 2019? And I think that's the best I've ever looked, but I put it in a 20 week camp and I got the most out of it. I got the best. The fight only lasted around, choked him unconscious. Uh, Alberto Del Rio. Oh, real, Alberto Del Rio. Big uh, wrestling fan here. Yeah, so yeah. Speak very openly about that. Yeah, so we we, we fought uh, for belts. I put my belt on the line, UFC belt against his WWE belt. And, uh, so you're the WWE champ? Yeah, I got it. And, <laughs> I, and I told my kids I was going to win it for them because my kids are huge fans of WWE. And I, when I brought the, they came to the fight with me and they walked out with me. And um, I told them I'd give them an extra $50,000 if you made it past the first round. And we got about two minutes into the round. I was like, okay, it's time to turn it up right now. And I ended up taking him down and getting his back and choking him. Um, and I got the belt. It looked like you put him in that rear no rear naked, almost a little too easy. Yeah. Um, and I think he, not think, he trained with uh, Ryan Bader and CB Dalloway in Arizona. And I called uh, Ryan, because I know Ryan, we fought against each other. And uh, I asked him, I go, how's he doing? He goes, just train. He goes, Tito, just train. He goes, just train as hard as you can. He goes, you won't have a problem. <laughs> And then that kind of gave me a little more motivation. I was like, all right, cool. And, and I did, like I say, I put in 20 weeks. It was the longest camp of my life. It was, it was hard. It was grinding, grueling. We sparred a lot, a lot of wrestling, a lot of jiu-jitsu. I was doing 18 miles of bike with 30 flights of stairs in between that 18 miles uh, and getting it down to about 42 minutes. So my cardio was just impeccable. Um, the things that I did for that camp, I wish I would have done earlier in my career, but I, I come to realize now that my body can sustain a lot of damage and uh, I can push through it. I now live in California. I've been here for two years. I first found out about Big Bear because of you and your training camps. Right. Yeah, that's now it's hell. like a getaway for me. Yeah, that. So we went up there just uh, right before the uh, the winter ended, and we went, took my kids uh, snowboarding. And I was getting flashbacks of how horrible it used to be up there. Because it's like the elevations were like eight thousand feet, uh, seven thousand. It's seventy five hundred where my my uh, house was, but 
the running up there, like for the first 17 days is strictly hell. It's like an iron weight on your chest. It's the hardest thing in the world. But, you know, once you get done of a, a nine week camp and you come down and we drive down to Vegas and, and seeing the lights is just that that feeling of like, all right, I accomplished that far. And now it's time to go to war. And that's 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 how it was. But Big Bear made me, made me the man I am today, for sure. Yeah. You know, I could have took shortcuts. I could have took the easy way out. And, um, but I was willing to step or stand down and grind on my fucking mouthpiece and let's go to war. <laughs> I don't think people realize because you're in the octagon with people that are about the same size as you, like just how big you are. Like when you shake someone's hand, it's like a catcher's mitt on your hand. <laughs> yeah, I think it's from all the like wrestling, all things. the pulling and grabbing and locking. Know. And no, but my, my dad was a big guy, you know, um, on my mom's side, my grandpa, he was a big guy, he was 6'3". Um, my dad was uh, 6'1". Um, I'm about 6'3". I'm six, two and a half around there. You know, I walk around right, right now, out of shape. I walk around about 240. When I'm in fight shape, I'm about 225. That's so, a big cut. Yeah, well, I mean, I go I go from, you know, in great fight shape. This is after my camp, you know, of, of nine weeks to 10 weeks. I'm about 225 and I get down to 205, which is my normal fight weight. Yeah. And it's hard to get down there, but it's hard enough where it's almost easy. You know, it's just, just, just enough where it kind of gets to that breaking point. Um, just recently, last year, I fought Anderson Silva in a boxing match with Triller and uh, I cut 40 pounds in one month. Oh, how? Guys, you don't even understand. I almost died. But, I mean, I didn't work a year and a half prior to that due to COVID and everything. Uh, so I was kind of uh, spent a lot of my savings uh, taking care of my bills. I take care of this house. I take care of my mom's house, uh, my family. And, and, and I, it just came to a point where I was like, please, Lord. And I was begging. I mean, I was literally praying every night going, please, Lord, give me an opportunity. Give me an opportunity. And, and the call came came a, a month before the fight and they asked if I'd fight Anderson Silva and before they could even say the next word I said yes. <laughs> How do you cut 40 pounds in a month? Um, no lifting. Uh, all I did was uh, cardio, um, mitt work, um, bag work, and sparring and dieting completely down. Like how many calories a day are we talking? Maybe 2,000. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to be like 800. No, maybe. The Christian may, Bale But still, diet. I mean that's three times a day that I got to eat. I mean that's nothing. I mean no, on a normal camp, I'm doing 4,500. Well, because you're burning so many calories. Yeah, yeah. And that's just to keep my weight on. I mean, yeah. I, if I eat less than that, then I start losing weight. But like I say, I mean, I'm, my, my frame is for 205. That was 205 was made for. I was the champion at the time, Zufa, who bought the company. Um, I remember, who was it? Uh, uh, Silva, the matchmaker. And he asked me, he's like, uh, Joe Silva. He's all, so what would be the perfect weight for you? I go, the perfect, I, perfect weight for me would be 205. I go, I'll walk around about 225. Mm -hmm. I go, cutting that 20 pounds, it'd be easy. I go, if you can make it that way, it'd be great. Because back then, I used to go down to 199. And that was hard. I mean, that was probably the hardest. I'd say, we'll fight um, Vandele Silva. I beat him. I was at 199. I fought Yuki Kondo. That was at 199. My last fight at 199 was against Evan Tanner. You know, rest in peace. So my, he passed away a long time ago. But uh, it was hard. And I had to keep my weight down. And against uh, Evan Tanner, it was the first time I went to Big Bear. But being in an altitude, when the air is thinner, yeah. your body gets dehydrated a lot quicker. So mm. actually my weight did come down a lot easier. Mm. But uh, being down here at sea level, um, it helps out a lot because I go to uh, Ascent Habitation. It's in uh, Newport Beach and I do a hyperbaric chamber and I do a sea vac, which is an altitude simulation machine. It simulates 25,000 feet in altitude. So I'm getting my red blood cell count up by using that machine. Um, I actually got a hyperbaric chamber upstairs here in my house. You use it every day? Yeah, yeah, I every use it every day. day. So hyperbaric chamber I do Monday through Friday, twice a day. Um, Let us in on some of your other like anti-aging things. You know, um, the hyper, excuse me, the CVAC, which is an altitude simulation machine, that's the one. That's the biggest one and not a lot of companies have it. Um, I know there's one in Arizona. I know Ryan Bader uses it. Um, there's one here in Newport that I would use prior to a fight and during sparring and getting leg kicked and getting punched in the face, body and so forth, after sparring, your body's sore as hell. I go in that machine, I do uh, three sessions of 20 minutes, and I come out and there's not, a, not one ache in my body at all. Wow. So what it's doing is reproducing red blood cells in your body. And then uh, I think it was four years ago, I got a hybrid chamber in my uh, room, and I come to realize once I have all these uh, red blood cells multiplying in my body, how can I compress them? hyperbaric chamber hyperbaric chamber compresses them now you build white blood cells mm. so the recovery is just amazing it's just uh something that's very scientific and the technology is amazing but it's something that a lot of fires should look into for sure so you're talking about getting in the cage one more time or at least yeah. one more time yeah at least one more time do you think you have another boxing match in you um 
Maybe if I do, I think someone at my level, you know, Anderson Silva is a lot more advanced than me, um, just because I've my whole life of fighting has been just aggression and forward and double leg guy to his back and just smash him. Yeah. Um, in boxing, it's like, uh, you know, it's almost like chess, you know, I kind of used to compare um, checkers as boxing and chess like MMA. But when I got a boxing match, I kind of realized that you can't be that aggressive person. You got to sit back and, and play the game. Um, and it's very technical, it's angle oriented. Um, there's a lot of things in it that's very methodical that you got to think and you got to have thought process for it for sure. Boxing seems to be on the come up right now. Like what the yeah. Paul brothers are doing is really like drawing a lot of attention. Well, the marketing, the guy, the key guy, they're very well uh, spoken. You know, they, they understand marketing and they're doing it themselves. Mm. You know, the things they're doing is pretty good. And I, I have no, no nothing bad to say about them. I, I think it's amazing about time someone can step up and kind of save boxing. It, it was needed since uh, Tyson left. You know, um, it's just uh, things that I see now that they can expose themselves so much better with social media, YouTube stuff. And these guys did, did it the right way. They did it smart. They're able to build the YouTube view of viewers up to, you know, it's like 20 million or something. Insane, and, yeah. And it's like crazy. And then they use that to catapult to the next thing in boxing. And they just, they work hard. And I got to respect for both of the brothers, for sure. Do you think we're going to see Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson? No, that's not going to happen. My, they both seem to want it to happen. Yeah, I... If they did, I, I don't know. Jake Paul, you get touched by Tyson. That's a that's a different story. Because they came to me for the fight, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'm all in. Let's do it." I, you and Mike Tyson? Nah, yeah, I would. I would have no what? problem. I, I, let me tell you, I'm a competitive person. I'm willing to take an ass whipping or give an ass whipping. It, it really doesn't. To me, it's just uh, that's a competitive mentality I have. You know, it's not about a fight. It's about a. Um, competing against another man. Would you fight against Jake Paul? I would love to. That'd be amazing. That'd be that, I mean, that'd be an interesting one. That, that would be fun. I mean, once again, I have an 0-1 record. He has a 3-0 record. You know, I, uh, I still feel like I'm an amateur in boxing. You know, I, I do it a lot in mixed martial arts, but still, I, I still feel myself as an amateur. I, but um, I'm competitive. I'm very competitive. We talked earlier about pro wrestling. Yeah. How close were you in your 20s to getting into pro wrestling? Um, so I went to, it was a WrestleMania 34, I think it was. It might have been 34 or 35 around there. They came to Anaheim, and I was the champion at the time. And they won. Won way back then. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like 2000. 34 would have been like uh, 2000. a few years ago. So that would have been like WrestleMania 16. 16, okay. Yeah. So it was 2000, and uh, they had the ladder match that day. Um, it was the Hardy Brothers versus oh, the Dudley TLC. Boys. Yeah, they, so they had that. And I went and do a, a um, like, I thought they were just interviewing me as a normal interview like this, kind of sit down and talk. But yeah. what they're looking to see what type of personality I had, what type of character I had. And I didn't know that. And I wish I would have known that because I would have sold myself way better. Um, I think I was too mellow-mannered. They wanted to see the crazy Honey to Beach bad boy. Oh, wow. That's what they wanted to see. And I didn't. no one told me anything. Yeah. No one said a word to me about it at all. And I went in and kind of just was being very polite and, you know, respectful and um, never heard anything back. And then... Uh, Actually, just was it 2019? Uh, Shane McMahon reached out to me and says, "What do you think about coming in and uh, just trying it out?" And I went and did it. And once again, I didn't think about this. And this is just about sitting here right now. I started thinking about. It. I was like, "That's why they didn't do it because I wasn't over the top. They want someone over the top and just be not crazy, but just like be an eye catcher." So and you had a, a performance center tryout? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I went to it. I went and trained uh, there with uh, Norman. Um, Norman Smiley. Norman yeah. Smiley. Yep. I trained with him. Amazing teacher. And I was learning stuff that it took guys six months to learn. He's like, wow, man, you really got this. And then COVID came about and I never heard anything. Well, you were that. part of TNA for a little while. Yeah, I did a little TNA. It was fun. Um, it was it was more of being an enforcer. Um, it was fun, but I thought I could do some matches. I, I, I just think I think I have what it takes and it would take a lot of hard work. I get it, but uh, I think it'd be fun. It would just be a dream for you. It'd be a lot of training. It's a lot of training. I did it. I, I, I did the, the two, two weeks. Um, training twice a day. I did it and I put myself through it and it was, it was hard. Um, it was like being in college wrestling again, you know, my, my, my body, you know, is subdued. No problem at all. I have no pain. Um, after I was done, I thought I'd have neck problems. You know, I've had four neck surgeries and I didn't have any problems. It was good. So yeah. as you sit here right now, nothing, nothing. hurts on you? Nothing. 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 And I just got back from a three day fishing trip on the Red Rooster three and we pulled on a bunch of tuna and you know, my hands were sore, of course, from gripping. I mean, you're fighting a fish for 20, 30 minutes. Sure. I mean, it gets tough, but um, nah, no pain. I'm very fortunate, man. What do you accredit that to? The surgeries? Uh, uh, surgeries. So 100% the surgeries. The surgeries for sure. Um, 
my, stem my, cells? my surgeon did an amazing job. I did stem cells once and that was when I fractured my neck. Uh, I was supposed to fight um, Rampage and I, uh, one of the visets on C7, it, it fractured completely through. Um, I actually went to Vegas and he goes, kind of, kind of keep this slow, but it's not supposed to be done here. Um, good thing he doesn't have his license anymore. He, he did something crazy, but uh, I was kind of the test big dummy <laughs> and I was willing to do it and I did it. And let me tell you, nine weeks later, there was no calcification around the, the set at all. And that's one of the main bones that could stick out the side of your uh, vertebrae itself. But uh, there was no calcification, which meaning uh, when it breaks, you usually get a little snap and it would healed completely through that there was no calcification at all. It didn't look like it was broken before. And that was from stem cell. But uh, the surgeries that I've had, he told me if I put the, the less hardware I put in you, the faster you're gonna be able to um, heal and your body be able to regenerate a lot faster. And once again, the CVAC was another one that helped out a lot because uh, it helped my cardio through the roof. Wow. And just the recovery and the healing process, it was a lot shorter. I've always wondered where your celebration came from. Uh, gosh, so I was, uh, I just won my world title and I went here to Carson in California and went to a Muay Thai event. And before the match, this guy from Thailand came out and he uh, started doing a grave digger before the match and grabbed the guy's face and threw it in and like looked at Mad Dog and I was like, oh, I'm still in that. <laughs> So I think like I said, it was like 2000 and then uh, I fought, uh, was it uh, Evan Tanner and I did it and it was just like, it blew up from then. I, once again, it was just those little antics that you do and just, you don't think about it until it's done and, and you did it and you're like, wow, that was pretty cool. But cause it's not just one motion. It's not like yeah. one touchdown celebration. Yeah. It's no. the digging, it's the grabbing the body, yeah, covering it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I say, I'm, I'm, I, I like to act. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, not a good actor. I'm like, you know, I, I just like doing it. It just, it just, it's kind of like an icing on the cake. Yeah. Yeah. Well then maybe there's pro wrestling in your future still. Yeah. You never know. Huh? Um, I don't know. Like I say, I, my age doesn't show what I am. You know, I, I feel a lot younger than what my age says. What are sure. three things that the average person could do today to look this good when they're 47? Um, eat healthy, uh, stay away from, so my biggest thing is no greasy food, uh, no whites as in white rice, white pasta, um, everything's wheat um, and no sodas and I stay away from drinking alcohol. Um, that, the sodas and the, the fried foods are the biggest thing. Keep away from that stuff. Fried foods, anything with oil is junk. Um, it's just eating healthy and having a, a good mentality of life. Um, don't try to be a saver. And what I mean by being a saver is someone of a relationship that you're trying to fix them and not mm. keeping yourself to your love yourself. You know, I went through that relationship myself where I tried to fix her so much that I lost myself. Mm. Now I was able to find my wife now that I've been with nine years and she's been my support. You know, when times I have hard days and she's going to be okay, babe. And, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm not mad enough to do it myself, but we're all human, you know? Yeah. Um, people say, you know, men are not supposed to cry. I, I cry at good movies and everything, but it's just one of those emotional things for, for a person to live in. If you live in a toxic relationship, it's going to, going to age you like no other, mm. you know, um, drugs and I don't do drugs, uh, super important. Um, but I think sleeping is one of my biggest secrets. I heard you in another interview say that you also don't do caffeine. I, during camp, I do not do caffeine at all. When camp's over. Yes. Uh, I, on Sundays, you know, what's uh, the reason behind that during camp? Uh, so it, uh, dehydrates the body, um, dehydrates the muscles. So you have a bigger chance of, you know, exhaustion and, and of tearing the muscle and so forth. But I, I think that's the biggest thing. But like I say, this is the biggest secret that people don't know and a lot of people can't do it is sleep. I can sleep 10 hours, no problem. And I don't know, maybe because I just, I'm an honest man, I do God's things, I don't have to worry about anybody getting something over on me or it's just. Um, <laughs> so you have no problem getting to sleep. Yeah, I have no problem yeah. getting to sleep. Like I say, I sleep from 10 o'clock at night till 10 o'clock in the morning sometimes. You know how many people are watching this that are so jealous right now? I, and I talk to a lot of people that are like, how do you sleep that much? And I have peace. I have peace of mind. I'm in your camp. My yeah. my bedroom is completely blacked out. Mine is completely blacked Can't out. Can't even see my hand this close in front of my face. And I'm with you. I, I could sleep 10 hours easy. Yeah. And I've done that since day one of my camps. You know, my fight camps, I would I would do. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's our security right there. there they are. Yeah. Right on, right? <laughs> Saving yeah, we, lives. We got the lifeguard, the county sheriff here. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, they, they try to it's Tito's backyard. No, they got to protect around here. You know, we've been having problems of, uh, of robberies that have been done here. And um, it's scary. They have enough balls to come in my house. You know, I got robbed. They stole my safe out of the floor. Um, they stole all my girls' shoes. They stole their purses. Jeez. They stole all my watches. And uh, it was probably about a half a million dollars in total that 
wound up uh, missing. <laughs> you weren't home when it happened. I was not home. Me and my uh, three boys were in uh, in Palm Springs. My wife was in uh, Texas, and we had enough balls to come and do it. So over the last, it's been a month now, from dusk until four in the morning, I've been searching this neighborhood. And I got about six or seven other people that live around here, their house got hit too, they've been doing the same thing. So we do a little, little uh, searches. Did you get anything on your cameras? Nothing. Oh, so man. I've been kind of suspicious about this. I've had a drone behind my home and there's been a drone like uh, a month and a half ago. And I was like, what's this drone just sitting here looking at me for? And I thought maybe it's like cops doing surveillance or whatever. I uh, come to find out that someone was been tapping into my, uh, my online uh, cameras and wow. uh, IP address that was on my camera there to break into it. And so they were watching me probably the month before. Wow. Of me going in and out, um, seeing where my safe was and come to realize that I kind of messed up and I should have did it the other way that my guy came in and he did a firewall on it. So now they can't oh, do like it. Encrypted? Yeah, 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 encrypted to get into it. But it's just vicious right now. This yeah. uh, whole Biden regime, the administration that is doing to our country is just, it's scary. Um, I lived in Huntington Beach my whole life, and the first time I'm going to move. I'm, I'm selling everything here. I'm moving to Florida. Um, I just want my kids around people that love America, that love this country, because this is the last country in the world that is as free as we are. And um, if, if I don't let my kids be around a positive environment, I'm afraid that uh, they'll get lost in the corruption. And would, I don't want that to happen. Would you think about running for public office again? Um, no. Um, at least as my kids right now get through school and college, maybe later on when I'm in Florida, maybe. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when I ran for city council here, I think I thought too small. I should have did governor. Um, I think that would have been a big change. Wow. Uh, just because when I got into city council, I got to see how corrupt it was. Even at the city level, it's super corrupt. Super, like just, it makes me disgust it to understand that people would want America to be what they, they're they trying to push right now. And, you know, I know a lot of uh, podcasts and so forth, guys say, oh, we're trying to keep away from talking politics. Now I understand why they say talk, stop talking about politics because they don't want people to understand that what's going on in their country. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell my kids and I show them right from wrong and I don't say what's right, I don't say what's wrong. I say, you figure this out and you tell me what you think. And every single time they say that is the right thing, that is the wrong thing. That's when I know I'm raising good men. Did you worry at all when you endorsed Trump that you would be alienating some of your audience or some of your fan base? Um, I didn't worry about it because it was, it was my children's future. And I was all in. I worked for Donald Trump uh, on a celebrity apprentice. Yeah. And prior to that, I knew who he was as a father. You know, I'd be at the fight events uh, in Jersey and he'd be there with uh, Junior and Eric. And it was like, that's a good dad. He's a billionaire, but he's bringing his kids to the fight with him. I'm all, that's a good man. Mm. And everybody loved him. Everybody, all rappers, actors, everybody loved him until he became president. Mm. And then all of a sudden it was, uh, he exposed what was really going on in this country. And he was willing to fight for it. You know, I think he lost over a billion dollars when he was president. Um, he didn't receive any money from uh, the government as being president. And that showed what type of patriot he truly was. Um, to me, it wasn't about my fans. Um, it was about my children. It was about my family. It was about the future of this country. Um, like I say, I, I've been to Iraq six times to see all the troops. I have a bunch of uh, special force friends. And they're all fighting for the freedoms and uh, the rights that we have here. And when he became president, I, I, I backed it. You know, I'm, I'm Mexican American. Actually, I'm a, I'm a mutt. I have French, I have Portuguese, I have Mexican, I have Native American, um, I have French, or I said French and Irish. So I'm, I'm a mutt. I have everything in me. At the end of the day, I'm an American. Yeah. And, and that's what's important to me. I've traveled the world. I've seen how the world is. I see how it works. And I don't want that here. I don't want that for my kids. Um, and there is some good countries, don't get me wrong, but there's other countries I went and seeing how shady they, they were, where I had to go to the country and, and be around criminals to be safe for myself. And it's crazy. I'm thankful. You know, times I've been in Mexico, you know, I, I've been around some cartel guys and you know they're not good guys. But at that time, they're good guys because they're protecting me. And yeah. um, that, that's the scary things that are going on right now with the borders that are being open, the way the raw houses are being robbed, how inflation is going through the roof and everybody still want to point fingers at each other. Um, at the end of the day, I, I, I wish Biden did a better job. I have, I'm not going to say he's not my president because he is. Um, I just, I wish he would do a better job. I wish he would care more about and put America first. And that's what Trump was doing. He was putting America first. Um, why start another war? Why be a part of another war and put America in danger where we could take care of our country? I mean, there's so many um, soldiers or veterans who come back from war that are on the streets now. You know, they send $40 billion to protect uh, Ukraine. And I had, that, that's their thing. I don't know what's going on in Ukraine. There's something fishy about all of it, where the money's going, but how about taking care of our country? 
And that's what I mean. That I've understood that because as I grew up in the 80s, was Reagan talking about, you know, communists come here and uh, they're not going to come here with guns and bullets. And <laughs> it's, we're, we're being overtaken right now without firing one round. And it's the most scariest thing in the world. And um, I hope this country lasts another year or two and a half years. I just I, I really look at it. And I hope that uh, something comes out better where the border is not as open as it is. Um, and this country is a lot more safer. You know, the things that they're doing to our children of just uh, it's just I, I, seems like it's a dream. Seems like, it's a like nightmare. you should run for president. No, 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 no. It's that's too much, too much for me. I I, I can sit here as a constituent and say what I want and not have to be, you know, um, branded <laughs> as one person. I, I, I want to take care of my kids. And when I, when I leave this earth, I want to make sure that my children are able to keep the name strong of the Ortiz of being respected. And um, that's my goal. That's what I want yeah. to do. You know, maybe I can keep people aware of uh, go out and vote, you know, register to vote, vote and, and see how this country is now and see how the country was uh, a year and a half ago. And you guys be the honest truth of uh, what you want for the future of our country. And it's important. I mean, like I say, it's not about Democrat. It's not a Republican anymore. This is about America. People need to understand that. Look, I'm Canadian and can't vote. I'm so no. grateful to be able to live here. Yep. I find it so interesting that it's basically you're on this team or that team. And that's how it's I'm, the blue team or the red team. It's wrong. Well, can't I think we be like wrong. some sort of purple team? You know? Yeah, no. And that's a, combination a, of the that's a scary thing if that comes out where it is does get split up like that. Um, what side do you stand on? You know, and for me, I, I stand on the future of, of uh, faith, freedom and family. That's mm -hmm. that's that's. Mm. This is this is my three F's, man. Three F's. Uh, that's my important thing, and that's what I got to teach my children. Does anyone ever call you H Triple B, the Huntington Beach bad boy? Um, eh, that's why I do interviews B. once in a while. Triple B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, no. That's one. That's actually, actually that's one of my emails. So oh, <laughs> I, no, I, I do use it, it. at AOL.com. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> when when are we going to see you in the cage? You talked about this uh, next fight. Yeah, probably like in October. Oh, uh, this year. Yeah, no, one hundred percent this year for sure. This for year. Freedom Fight Night. Correct. Yep. Yep. So uh, I had Harrison on the show recently. He, okay. he was teasing this off camera with me. Okay. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll talk to well, you. Well, if, if he can make it happen, I think <laughs> he's the person to make it happen. I really do. Uh, I, I met uh, Harrison about a year and a half ago. Amazing man, uh, amazing individual, you know, family man, family oriented, and that's the, my type of guy. So if this fight goes well, do you think we'll ever see you in the UFC again? Mm, uh, I don't want to say no. I think I'll give that to Dana to say no. Um, and I, 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 I think I made a mistake a while back saying I'll, I'll never fight for the UFC. And um, came back to bite me in the ass. And it is what it is. He's but holding you to that? Yeah, yeah. I think he's holding me to that. You know, I, I wish he can get over the hard feelings. Uh, you know, it's life. And life's too short to hate. Yeah. You're probably a very different person now than you were when you said that. I was a nightmare back then. I was with my ex. I was drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, I, I, I really got strongholds to the things I said. I probably shouldn't have said them because I was doing by hearsay. You know, mm -hmm. I, and I, I made some mistakes, but since then I matured so much. Things of life changed completely. You know, even though it's just fighting, you know, I've got, was it uh, four and, or five and two in the last uh, six years. So I, I've done very well. I just, just the reaction my body, the things I've done, I, I can get into a camp. I can push myself as hard as I can when it comes to fight time. I'm prepared. I'm ready to go to war. You yeah. know, that last boxing match wasn't me. Um, I look at the weigh-in picture of me and Anderson against each other. And anybody can look that up online and see how skinny I was. I was like, man, I look at Ethiopian. I had no arm muscle, no definition, nothing. I was like, and I didn't. I didn't do no weight training at all. But, you know, you live and learn. And I live and learn from it. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be great to just see you in the crowd at a UFC fight. Yeah. You know, I... I I think about that also, you know, I wish I would have got a little more respect for men, but I, I get it. And I, I, you know, you, you make the bed, you lie in and, uh, yeah. or you lie the bed you make. And yeah. I, I, I've, I've done that and, you know, but that's behind me now. So now it's just about the future of what I'm going to do and, um, make sure I raise my men the right way. And that's what I'm talking about my kids. Yeah. You know, it's important and to be happy, you know, to be happy yeah. and love life, you know, cause life is too damn short. As we wrap this up, what do you think is the best piece of advice that someone's given you? The best piece of advice that someone's given me. Um, work hard and have no regrets. And I always do respect some values. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I want to make sure when I go to bed that I've got the most out of the day today. And that's what's important. And okay. do it the right way. Do it with integrity, with respect. 
um, in the fight, in the, during the fight, so people gotta understand, this is a little different here. We're talking about life or a fight in general. A fight in general, I'm gonna attack a person psychologically as much as possible, it's psychological warfare. In life, I wanna treat everybody like a brother to me. It's like family to me. Anybody that's in my circle, anybody who knows me and ever hung out with me, I treat them like, like family. I'm like yeah. the secure, like the, I'm, I'm their security. Um, and I think that's when the values kind of step in of knowing that at the end of the day, I'm no different than you. I don't hold myself any higher. I, I keep myself at a grounded level. And it's important because all this stuff could be taken away in a flip of a switch. Yeah. And I'm thankful. You know, I'm thankful God gave me the gifts that I have, um, but I had to work for them. I had yeah. to bust my ass. I had to be responsible for these actions that I, I have achieved through my life. And, you know, I've never been a victim. You know, I had a victim mentality when I was younger and I couldn't realize that that shit wasn't getting me anywhere. I got to think positive. I got to stay positive and I got to think what the next, what's the next best thing that I can do to help myself and my family and the people that I surround myself with. Yeah. And uh, there's another advice lesson that I learned was who I surround myself with and who I become. Yeah, and 100%, great. I mean, I, I understood this when I became world champion. It was like I hung out with a bunch of knucklehead gang members. It was like, dude, look at the people you're hanging out with, man. You're going to become those people. And I stopped, and then that's when I started hanging out with Lorenzo and Dana and all those guys and being around billionaires. Like, I want to be like this. I got an opportunity to meet Donald Trump and be around him during the, or during, uh, the Subway Apprentice. And I was like, then you realize that the people you surround yourself with, you have a chance to become him. And uh, it's just all psychological stuff you go yeah. through each and every day of, of knowing that you can achieve those things. I end every conversation talking about gratitude because it's such an important thing to me. I wake up every day, I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for. Yes. And I end every conversation with that. So Tito, what are three things in your life you're grateful for right now? Um, happy family, uh, being a hard worker, and knowing that nothing can break me. Love that. I, I, I really, really believe in those things. And like I say, my, my family being happy is has to be the number one. You know, my kids can have a smile on their face and saying, Dad, I love you. Um, my wife could have a smile on my face and say, Honey, I'm proud of you. Um, as a kid, that's all I was ever wanted. If someone says, tell someone that they love me and um, they care. Yeah. And uh, that was the things as a kid I never had. So yeah. I had to make sure my kids have those things. I wanna just acknowledge you. Like, first of all, thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you for inviting us to your beautiful house. You're a champion inside the cage and outside of the cage. And I just wanna acknowledge you for just the man that you are. Thank you. I, you know, I, I was, there was a bad picture painted on me uh, during my career and people never really understood who I was until I got away from UFC. And then people are like, wow, they got to see a little bit what is the ultimate fighter of being a coach. Yeah. And uh, like I say, at the end of the day, you know, this ain't about fighting. This ain't about business. It's about being a human being in society that's willing to give back in a positive manner. Yeah. And that's what I teach my children. That's what I want to get across. And it's important. I'm a real guy. You know, I, 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 I've, I've made it, um, but I'm not done. I'm far from done. I have a lot, lot more to do. A lot more to do, for sure. I don't want to take advantage of this life right now. Yeah. Tito Ortiz. Thank you, awesome. sir. You're very welcome. There's that catcher's mitt. Look at yeah, the size yeah, no, of that right? hand. I got some mitts. <laughs>